Okay, continuing in our, in our study of replacement theology and why it does not line up with the teachings of the New Testament, you can turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And now in this second part here, this, this uh, video is going to be three parts, like I said, uh, and if you watch the first part, the second part here uh, is going to show verses that show clear distinction between Jews and Gentiles after the crucifixion after Israel has rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah nationally. Now, there were still a lot of Jews that were getting saved, okay? Uh, but nationally, uh, they did reject Jesus Christ as their Messiah. So then, according to replacement theology heretics, then God, from that point on, uh, the Jews or any mention of Jews or Israel is referenced to spiritual Jews or Israel being a reference to the church. That's what these nuts believe and what they teach. Okay, so uh, what, we're, what you should not see then is you should not see any kind of distinction between Jews and Gentiles if replacement theology is true. And of course in the third part here, which we're going to be getting to at the end of the second part, obviously, um, you're going to see proof that Israel is brought back in unbelief. Again, the teaching of replacement theology is because the modern-day nation of Israel rejects Jesus as their Messiah, then they can't be God's chosen people, therefore it's the church that replaces Israel. Okay, I've already shown you in the first part of this study all the scriptures that they use to try and prove that, that God is all done with the Jews. Uh, they don't work out. And they take those verses horribly out of context. They twist the scriptures and all kinds of things to make it fit into their warped system. But now let's look at some scriptures here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to go to verse 22 through 24. It says here, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, it seems kind of strange that you'd have to preach basically uh, and, and show the early sign gifts and stuff like that there if God was all done with the Jewish nation. Why make a distinction between Jews and Gentiles and how they each receive things? And you say, well, yes, but you see that was there at the beginning. The sign gifts, they went away, and so that's no more. All well, except for the fact that um, the Jews still require a sign. That's why Moses and Elijah come back during the time of Jacob's trouble. You see, the Great Tribulation time period is for the Christians. It's for the purification of Christ's church. <laughs> you know, oh, really? Then what are Moses and Elijah doing coming back? How many Christians need to see Moses and Elijah coming back and doing the same miracles? Elijah calling fire down out of heaven. Moses turning water into blood. Repeating what they did back in the Old Testament. And many, many other tie-ins too there, by the way. Why does the body of Christ need that? I'll give you a hint. We don't. Who does? Well, according to our text here, the, for the Jews require a sign. You know what's going to convince a lot of the Orthodox Jews? I'm not going to convince. I mean, some of them are so stubborn. They are a stiff-necked people. You know, uh, some of the most arrogant people I've ever met in my life are Jews. Okay deal with it. You know I'm telling you the truth. I mean, if you're a Jew, you're, you know, you can be honest enough to say, yeah, you know, there's some arrogance here. I mean, Germans are very stubborn people too, you know, I might add, you know, so I'm not going to get offended. Don't get offended yourself. The point is, Jews require a sign. And a lot of them are not going to listen to me. I can read you scripture after scripture after scripture, compare it to the Old Testament, show all the tie-ins, and you're not impressed. You want to see a sign, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what happened with Exodus. Moses could have walked in there and said, Hey, I'm here. I'm the servant of the Lord. You know, let's all go out of here and stuff like that. But God brought them out with signs. The first miraculous signs were there to bring the Jews out of Egypt. And guess what? The Jews are back in Egypt, spiritually speaking. They're back with the pagan deities and all that other stuff. So guess what's going to have to be used to bring them back? Signs. How about seven years of signs to confirm the New Testament? See, how are you going to do that? Oh, uh, the book of Revelation. The play-by-play -play book. Compare it to the book of Daniel. And you see the tie-in with the Old Testament there. The book of Daniel, 
Revelation tie together and you see all these signs coming to pass to confirm uh, the book of Revelation. And Moses and Elijah, they're preaching it. Uh, those are signs. But you see, if, uh, if the nation of Israel has been done away with, why the signs coming in the future? If it's just uh, spiritual Israel, the spiritual Jews, what are Moses and Elijah doing over in the streets of Jerusalem? It's a real problem for you if you're into replacement theology. You've got to spiritualize a whole lot of stuff. Spiritualize is a, uh, things, by the way, is a Catholic term for we can't handle the scriptures, so we try to lie about it. To just break it down and make it as simple as it can be. Okay? Uh, you don't need to spiritualize the Bible. When you see somebody start to change the King James Bible, change the text of it and say, well, it's, it says that, but it doesn't really mean that. Uh, you're dealing with somebody that can't handle the scriptures. False prophet, in other words. But let's continue. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to show you some more scriptures here that talk about a difference between Jews and Gentiles. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20. It says here, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. Huh? You mean there's a difference there? To, you know, to the Gentiles, you know, and, and things, he's, Paul's acting one way, but then he goes and he gets around the Jews and he has to act another way? Why? The nation of Israel is no more. It's all just spiritual Jews. Any mention of Jews in the New Testament there, the Pauline epistles, it's all just spiritual Jews. It's spiritual Israel. Then why does Paul have to act differently to the Jews? You see, you see the, the insane, idiotic nonsense that, that replacement theology is? You know, and, and, you know and, and I really, I mean, some of you little princesses out there that get offended when I say words like idiotic or stupid, uh, I really don't care, okay? If you, if you don't like my, my harsh, sarcastic attitude that I have, then go back to playing your video games on little children websites, okay? where you can win games and get prizes and be the highest little score for the day, okay? Go play with a little ball in the corner or something like that, all right? There are some things that are just plain down idiotic, and I'm going to be honest enough to say so. And it is stupid to try and say that every mention in the Pauline epistles of Jew or Israel is referring to the church. That's stupid. It's idiotic. All right, Paul is clearly saying, when I'm around the Jews, I have to act one way. When I'm around the Gentiles, I act another way to win them. And you know what? It's still true today. If I'm around a bunch of Gentiles, hey, I can eat pork products and things like this and, and, and you know, act in certain ways and whatever else. There are Gentiles that have certain customs and cultures and whatever things like that. But if I get around a bunch of Jews, I'm going to abstain from those meats, abstain from pork and things. Why? I don't need to needlessly offend those people. I'm not going to do that. I mean, the New Testament gives grounds that you can, whatever kind of animal, every creature of God is good, you know, and, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving for sanctified by the word of God in prayer. That's New Testament. But you see a Jew that says, I don't want to eat the pork products and things like that. That's fine. Absolutely fine. There are Jewish customs that are perfectly in line with Scripture, and you don't need to scrap them. Just because you say, well, I'm a Christian, so I just have to act like the world now. No, 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 no. No. There are many Old Testament practices and things and, and Jewish feast days and whatever else that you can keep those things. You know? I mean, Paul... You know, was was going different places and things and, and until Pentecost. He's he's celebrating Pentecost. But there's no difference anymore. You know, we're just all just blended uh, spiritual Jews now. Wrong. Next, we're going to go to First Corinthians chapter ten, verse thirty-two. And you know, again, I want to I want to speak plainly so people know what I'm saying. You know, I went through years and years and years and years and years of trying to find preachers out there that just Tell me what you mean. I don't want to come out of this sermon going, 
I think I understand what he was standing for, but maybe I don't know. You know, <laughs> I went through Babel buildings like that, where it's, you know, well, I don't, you know, that's, I don't really want to say one way or another, but, you know, da, 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 da. They're trying to please everybody so they can make more money, see? Okay, that doesn't happen here. You know, when I do videos and when my wife joins me in videos, we believe in being, being blunt and letting you know exactly what we believe. And if it offends you, well, okay, whatever. I'm sorry about that, you know. Um, but if the facts are the facts, well, then it's your problem, not ours. But let's continue. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32. We're going to see another distinction here that made between the Jews and the Gentiles. Look at this. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Wait a second. The church of God is spiritual Israel, according to replacement theology. We're the spiritual Jews. Then why are Jews mentioned there? Three distinct, distinct groups. Jews, Gentiles, the church of God. Weird, isn't it? I mean, the nation of Israel has been done away with, and they're all just, you know, uh, white Europeans over there in Israel right now, and God's all finished with them. Then why the distinction? Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. And again, we're going to see this thing, you know, like over in Galatians. Uh, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Okay. Again, we see this thing of saved Christians. There's no distinction between saved Christians. You know, and but if you compare this one over to the one in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, I think it is, where it talks about there's neither bond nor, nor free, there's neither male nor female. See, these distinctions are there, but in terms of when we become Christians, then we are all one. There is equality as Christians. Now, that means it doesn't mean that we all have the same tasks and whatever else. There are different members of the body. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about that. That's fine. You know, there are certain people that are not called to ministry that, uh, in terms of uh, preaching and teaching the Word of God. There are certain people that are better at, at street evangelism. Certain people are better at uh, musical types of things, you know. Like I've said many, many times, if you have musical talent, it'd be great to have somebody actually put out instrumental CDs, just piano playing of old hymns. All the old hymns, just go through the hymn book, you know, and just play them. I mean, a lot of those old hymns, you know, we're losing them. I don't even know a lot of the old hymns. You know, I look at a hymn book and I'm going, I don't know what this one is and I don't know what that one is. I mean, there's a lot of talents out there that can be used for the body of Christ. All right, so we all have different offices, but in terms of, uh, in terms of our, you know, one better than the other, no, not in the body of Christ. If you're Jew or Gentile, it doesn't really matter in the body of Christ. But that is, you can't use that to say then, then, God has somehow done away with the physical Jews. Well, that's just not there. Next, go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, starting at verse 11. It says here, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, what's the truth of the gospel? Once you're in Christ, there is no division. We're all one in Christ. See, that's the truth of the gospel. Jesus Christ died for sinners. Are you a sinner? I didn't say, are you a Jewish sinner or a Gentile sinner? I said, are you a sinner? Well, I'm a Jew and I keep the law. You can't keep the law to be saved. You know that. You know you can't keep the Ten Commandments perfectly. There's no animal sacrifice to cover your sins. Are you a sinner? 
or are you a you're a good person that's going to work your way to heaven, you know, and and work your way there to be resurrected and everything else? Uh huh. No, you're not. Jesus Christ is the means of salvation, Jew or Gentile. And when you get saved, you're part of the body of Christ, and then there is no division. But let's continue. Verse 14, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? I thought the Jews were no more. I thought there was no more Jews, it's just spiritual Jews. Now look at verse 15. We who are Jews by nature, according to the flesh, you know, and not sinners of the Gentiles. Hmm. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Put that in your pipe and smoke it if you're a Jew. I'm not telling you to smoke, by the way. I'm just use a little sarcastic statement. By the works of the, the law, there shall no flesh be justified. You can't keep the Ten Commandments perfectly without ever failing it. Can't do it. You need Jesus Christ. You need His righteousness imputed to you. And if you, re if you reject His righteousness, well, then you better hope that you can survive the entire time of Jacob's trouble and make it to the judgment of the nations and get through. Okay, and you're still going to have to believe in Jesus Christ. You're still going to be bowing down to him. So, you know, what's the point? Uh, you do well to get saved. Saved from your own self-righteousness. And saved from a religion that all they can offer you is good works. Just like the Catholics or the Muslims or, or any of the false religions out there. You see, Judaism came up to a point where they needed a perfect savior. They needed a king because it's good king and then it goes bad king and then it's good king again and then bad king again and good and bad and then good and then bad. So, you see, the king came and he presented the kingdom of heaven. It was offered to the Jewish people back there in the first century. They rejected him. They crucified their king. So the kingdom had to be put off for a while. And in that time period, now anybody can get saved, Jew or Gentile. But the promise is still there. That covenant is still there for the Jewish people. And they're finally going to get that rightful king. But it's going to be a very, very, very bad time in the time of Jacob's trouble. And most of the Jews are going to get slaughtered. And like I said, if you're watching this video right now, you have a chance to get saved now. You say, well, I need to see more signs. I just need to see, I need to see proof and things. You're going to see more proof than you want. I mean, if I went back to, to World War II Germany and I said, uh, you know, pre the Holocaust, and I'd say to some of the Jews over there, you know, there's going to be some really bad times coming. I mean, uh, these Nazis, these Germans are going to be, you know, taking you into the camps and you're going to get tortured and all this other stuff and they're going to be using some of you, your skin for making lamps and lampshades and things like this and they're going to, you know, gas you and they're going to kill about six million of you. You know, how many Jews do you think would have believed me? All we need to see proof. They saw it. Do you need to see proof of what's coming? You'll see it. If you reject the way out. Jesus Christ said, I am the door. John, in Revelation chapter 4, he sees a door open in heaven. John chapter 10 is where Jesus Christ said that he's the door. And he calls his sheep by name and leads them out. John looks up into heaven, he sees a door. Here's a voice, as it were a trumpet. Come up hither. Boom, he's up there. A picture of what's going to happen at the rapture the catching away of the bride of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. If you miss it, you go into the worst time period in history. No time like it. Seven years. 
the second time, only the second time that God has judged the whole world. The first time was the flood in the days of Noah. The second time will be the time of Jacob's trouble. The flood in the days of Noah, 40 days, 40 nights. The time of Jacob's trouble, seven years. I mean, why do you think I do this ministry? What is the purpose of me coming on here and spending my time to warn people? You say, well, it's just a fairy tale. The New Testament's not true. It's just this. It's got problems or whatever else. Uh, I can guarantee you it's true. The prophecies that are given in this New Testament, um, there are hundreds of them, many, 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 many of them, and they are all coming to pass. I mean, it's incredible. But that'll be for more of a future study there. Um, we'll continue here with our study. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Turn there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. Another real problem for the uh, replacement theology heretics that believe that they are, the church is all, you know, the great tribulation is for the church, you know. They come up with all these terms that don't even appear in Scripture. The Great Tribulation is not a Bible term as far as a title is concerned. It's a description. You know, and I challenge these, these heretics on this all the time, and they never, ever, ever can prove it. They'll quote verses out of Matthew chapter 24, shall, Then sh shall there be Great Tribulation. I say, what is the context? It's a, t it's, it's a description. It's not a title. It's never a title in your King James Bible. Never. And yet they'll keep repeating it and repeating it and repeating it. Why? Because they cannot call it Daniel's 70th week. They cannot call it the time of Jacob's trouble. Because that those two titles clearly identify it's for the Jewish people. But how can it be for the Jewish people if the Jewish people are no more? <laughs> you know, see, it just <laughs> these people are insane. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Wait a second. The Jews are no more. So what is the temple of God? Keep your hand there in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians and go back to Matthew chapter 24. And again, I've talked about this in plenty of studies, but if you haven't heard about this, I'll show you, compare Scripture to Scripture, it all lines up. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Where is it at? First Baptist Church. Faithful word, Baptist Church, Tempe, Arizona. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Where is God's temple? You say, well, it can't be the rebuilt temple that they're going to try to build over there in Jerusalem. It can't be that. Oh, yeah, actually it is. The third temple. Interesting, because uh, God is three in one. Hmm. Yeah, the third temple. Nothing to it. But uh, this third temple over there, you say, but it's not going to be built by people that believe in Jesus Christ. It's going to be built, and the Antichrist is actually going to rule and reign from it. Yeah, but it's in uh, the city of the great king, Jerusalem. Why do you think the Pope is trying to take that city and make it an international city? You know why? Because he's getting ready to hand over his authority to the Antichrist. The Antichrist that a lot of Jews are going to foolishly accept as their Messiah. See how it's all tying together? And uh, Jesus Christ is quoting Daniel from the Old Testament. So you can't duck it. You can't say, well... I'm a Jew and I reject the New Testament. Okay, what do you do with the, back in Daniel? Where he confirms the covenant with many for one week. What are you going to do with that? You're going to reject the Old Testament? 
But again, if you believe in replacement theology and all the references are to, to spiritual Jews, the body of Christ, where's the temple of God at? How does that prophecy work out for you if you are into uh, replacement theology? I'll give you a hint. It doesn't work for you. So you might as well drop it. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Turn there next. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the spiritual Jews. Oh, wait a second. It doesn't say spiritual Jews. It says of the Gentiles. Oh, Paul, what a nasty, bigoted thing to say. Colon, spiritual Jews, spiritual Israel, Gentiles. Why would he call saved Christians Gentiles? Because there's a distinction. Again, remember what I said in the previous part there, the, the, the first part of this study. You go back here to the first century, it wasn't Gentiles that had been raised generationally down through, coming down through and hearing all the stories of the Old Testament and things. These Gentiles back then, they were completely ignorant. They were, they were uh, um, heathen types of people. So they had no idea about Moses or the Garden of Eden or, or Noah and the flood and things. They had no idea about stuff like that. So Paul is there. He's having to teach these Gentiles. But if they're spiritual Jews, why would he call them Gentiles? I mean, it's, this stuff isn't even really that deep doctrinally. I mean, it's just common sense. He says Gentiles. You don't need to say Gentiles if all Christians are spiritual Jews. But even something as simple as that will go right over the head of some of these replacement theology heretics. You know why? Because the Bible says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto them, unto him. Neither can he know them because they are, uh, because they are spiritually discerned. Let me get the verse. I want to make sure I'm quoting that correctly. 1 Corinthians. Chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Uh, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So I got it pretty close. I want to make sure I get it right. But, see, lost people can't understand Scripture. And I don't say that everybody that's ever said anything about replacement theology, I don't say that they're all lost. I realize that there are some brand new Christians that can get deceived into movements and get pulled in and suckered into things and they end up repeating horrible, blasphemous types of things like that. But the Holy Spirit will lead them out of that. You might be one of those right now that's going, wow, you know, I never heard these scriptures. I, man, I guess, you know, Anderson is wrong. I got deceived by the guy. That's fine. I'm not going to judge somebody like that. Who I judge are the ones that are saying replacement theology is the only way and Stephen Anderson's video and Tex Mars and all these other heretics, Catholic heretics that they are. Because Catholics are the ones that came up with, with replacement theology. They're the main uh, ones that perpetuate this lie. You know, that's why I call them Catholics. And, you know, but these people that just continually go with it and go with it and go with it, they're the ones I attack. Okay? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. Here's another good one. You want to pin a replacement theology heretic that says, oh, it's spiritual Jews, you know, and stuff like this. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10 is a good one. They can't answer this one either. It says here, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes. Oh, that saved Christians. Keep reading. That they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Hmm. So you have elect people here who are not saved. What are you going to do with that? Hmm? Who are the elect? Lost elect? Well, if you read over in the book of Romans... Uh, chapter 11 and, and uh, chapter 9, like we read earlier, you'll see that the elect um, are Israel, the Jewish people. The ones that are blinded right now. But God's all done with them, right? Wrong. 
Just show you another little obvious one here. This is another fun one. The book of James, chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Hmm. But the Jews rejected Jesus after the crucifixion, so the Jews are no more. God's all done with the Jews, right? I don't think so. There they show up again. And the twelve tribes, nonetheless. Hmm. No mention of the tribes after the crucifixion. A lot of these guys will tell you. But now we're going to go on to the final part. Part three. Proof that Israel is brought back in unbelief. Turn back one book from James to the book of Hebrews. Now when the Bible says Hebrews, it's referring to, you know, uh, Native Americans and Africans, you know, and things and, and uh, people from China and, and Germany and France and stuff. Those are Hebrews. <laughs> I'm being a little sarcastic. No, they're Jews. Okay. And I believe that the, book of, the books of Hebrews and James specifically are very, very strongly pointed towards Jews, you know, Hebrews in the time of Jacob's trouble. But let's continue here. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 15. It says here, verse 7, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, Today if ye will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation. What is the provocation a reference to? Exodus. They provoked God in the wilderness. They provoked Him to anger time and time and time again. In fact, they provoked, not only did they provoke God, they provoked Moses. Moses lost his temper a couple of times. Got the Ten Commandments, he's walking down. God's written these you know, on the tables of stone, and he's carrying these things down. I mean, written by the very finger of God, and he gets down there, and there they are, they're naked and, and worshiping this golden calf and everything. And what's, what's Moses do with actually written from God, Ten Commandments, right there they are. What's he do? Smash! Throws them down on the ground. Provocation, you see. He's there to the, the rock. There, they need water and everything. They, oh, give us water. He brought us out here to perish. We should have stayed back in Egypt. And Moses is like, you rebels. Wham! And he hits the rock and the water comes out. And because of it, he doesn't get to go into the promised land as a result of that. What was it? Provocation. That's what this is a reference to. But wait a second. Verse 9 says, when your, your fathers. Who's the book written to? Hebrews. Um, my fathers are German. My wife's father's German. Our ancestors are from Germany, Deutschland. Many of you, your ancestors are from the UK or from whatever else. It goes back to Japheth. Some of you, your ancestors go back to Ham in Africa. Some of you might be Shemitic of other types of kindreds and things going back to different Orientals or Native Americans or whatever else. Our fathers weren't there in the wilderness. Uh, we aren't Jewish. We're Gentiles. So, God was all done with the Jews and everything else. The Hebrews are, you know, the, the, the book of Hebrews is for Christians today. Well, then you have a real problem. Because uh, apparently, Paul, and I do believe it was Paul that wrote the book of Hebrews, um, he must have been kind of confused writing to Gentile Christians by saying your fathers in the wilderness there. 
when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Um, my fathers weren't in the wilderness. Why would Paul write a book to Hebrews for the end times if the Hebrews are no more? <laughs> Have we learned our lesson yet, students? I certainly hope so. Anybody who takes replacement theology seriously is either lost or so green that you could stick them in the ground and they'd root. All right. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. We'll read a couple verses here. Okay, it says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Speaking about Jesus Christ. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Hmm. Ye are dull of hearing. Uh, who's the book written to? Hebrews. Are there any tie-ins to this? Turn in your Bible, keep your hand there in Hebrews chapter 5, but turn back to Matthew chapter 13. Let's see if there's a tie in here, this thing of being dull of hearing. Matthew 13. Actually, we'll go to Matthew chapter 10. Go to Matthew chapter 10. So we can see who Jesus is referring to here in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. It says here, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Who is Jesus' audience? Jews, Israel in other words. Occasionally you'll have a Gentile, a centurion, and a, a Canaanitish woman and stu stuff like that. They'll come in. But the audience that Jesus is speaking to primarily is Jewish. Mar Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse 13. Okay, it says here, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. Look at verse 15. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. If you're a saved Jew out there, verse 16 applies to you. If you're a lost Jew, verses 13 through 15 apply to you. I mean, it just amazes me to see how many prophecies have been fulfilled in the New Testament, and yet the Jew, Jewish people still reject? It's weird. It's really, really weird. What's going on? Their ears are dull of hearing. They close their eyes. And notice too there in, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 15, it says here, and should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should Heal them. Yeah, the, the Jew has an advantage according to Romans chapter 3, but uh, the Jew is still a sinner. The Jew is still on, on their way to hell. You still need to be healed. You're sick. According to the New Testament, Jesus Christ came to heal you of that sickness of sin. How else are you going to get it? Good works. That's what the Catholics do. That's what they claim. That's what all other false religions do. 
as I've said before, what do you have that other religions don't have? Heritage? Is that going to assure you salvation? No. Now go to Romans chapter 11, which we read earlier, but I'm just going to show you this thing again. Romans chapter 11, verse 7. Romans 11, verses 7 through 8. It says here, What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. As a nation, but individually you can get saved. Look at verse 25, Romans chapter 11, verse 25 through 28. It says here, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel for permanently forever because the Jews are done away with. Oh, well, no, wait, it doesn't say that. It says uh, blindness in part, in part, notice that too, by the way, individual Jews can still get saved, not total blindness to anybody who's Jewish, but blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Has the fullness of the Gentiles become in? Has it come in yet? No. Nope. Um, well then, in the end times, then that would mean that the fullness of the Gentiles has not come in yet, so Israel is still blinded. So how could you make the stupid statement saying that Israel would have to come back in belief for them to be genuinely Israel when the Bible says they're blinded when they come back? Another little argument of uh, replacement theology that doesn't work. But let's continue reading. Um, verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. So, again, you see it there. Right? Jesus Christ restores the nation of Israel at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. Right? They're brought back in unbelief. They require a sign. The Lord obliges. Brings back Moses and Elijah. They're there for three and a half years. Signs and wonders for the Jewish people. Preaching the word. Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Jewish people. Then, the last three and a half years, it gets real bad. Uh, those that Jews that survive that thing go to the judgment of the nations. If they make it through that, they go into the millennial kingdom. But man, <laughs> why go through all that stuff when you can put your faith in Jesus Christ right now and get saved and get out of the whole time of Jacob's trouble and be part of the body of Christ? Much, much better. But we're going to go to one more place here in Scripture and then we're going to be done with this study. Ezekiel chapter 36. Now, if you want to hang a replacement theology heretic, there's a couple places that you can take them in the Bible and they cannot answer it. I've been dealing with these people, like I said, for many, many years now. And these scriptures, they can't handle it. They'll have to spiritualize it. They'll have to say, well, it's symbolic or it's this or it's that, whatever. You know, because their three big arguments are, number one, that the Jews have been replaced by the body of Christ. We are now spiritual Jews. They do that. Number two, there are no distinctions between Jews and Gentiles after they've rejected Jesus as their Messiah. We've debunked that. Number three is the one there that Israel cannot be brought back in unbelief. There are no clear scriptures saying that. We're going to show you the clear scriptures that do teach that. Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 21. Read down here to the end of the chapter. It says here, But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Doesn't sound like they're in belief, because they aren't. Verse 22, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. 
And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. Okay? And let me just say this before we read the next verse. One of the favorite things that they'll do, and Stephen Anderson, I've been kicking that little devil for a long time now, and he openly said in one of his sermons, and I have the video clip, one of my Stephen Anderson and his lies uh, videos, he says that all Old Testament prophecies concerning Israel were fulfilled before Jesus Christ showed up on the earth. Okay? But let's just read verse 24, and we're going to see that that little theory of his falls flat on its face. Verse 24, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries hmm, and will bring you into your own land. Were the Jews in all countries before Jesus Christ showed up on the earth? No. So you see, this is a prophecy for these end times where we are currently living. And as I said in my, my one recent video, they're about uh, the, when is the next Holocaust going to start. The Jews that are in America don't want to leave America and go back to Israel. They got it comfortable here in America. And uh, unfortunately, God's going to have to do something about that. Just like he did with the Jews that were in Germany and didn't want to leave Germany. And I'll tell you right now, again, if you're Jewish, you better wake up to the rising anti-Semitism. The best thing that you can do is going to, is, is to get saved. But if you say, no, nah, I don't want to, I don't want to believe, be a Christian. I don't want to see it. I, I just can't understand it right now. Then you better get over to, to Israel. Better get to the, your, the, the bounds of your habitation. Like the Bible says, you better get to your homeland quickly. Make the move. All right? Because if you don't, God's going to make some things happen here in America that you're going to want to move. And I'm not saying that I want that or anything else. It's a bad thing. But Jew, hatred of the Jewish people is, is getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And it's not just among Muslims. Okay, It's going to be professing Christians in the future. The Catholics hate you. The Muslims hate you. But it's even going to be professing you know, Protestants. Protestants are just Catholic light, you know, is all that that thing is. But let's continue. Verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments, and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the corn, and will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree, and the increase of the field, that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Then shall, re then shall ye remember your own evil ways, and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. That's what's coming. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God. Be it known unto you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, In the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the wastes shall be builded. And the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, This land that was desolate is become like the garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. Then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I the Lord builded, or build the ruined places and plant that that was desolate. I the Lord have spoken it and I will do it. Okay, And right there, by the way, I don't think it's going to happen. Do you, you realize the, 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 uh, the statement that the Lord made right there in that passage? I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Not, I, I might do it if things kind of work out, you know. And th I will do it. 
So the devil comes along and he says, no, actually Israel's not going to come back. The nation of Israel is done, it's gone, and whatever else. Why? He's denying what God says. Verse 37, Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by them, or by the house of Israel, to do it for them. I will increase them with men like a flock, as the holy flock, as the flock of Jerusalem in her solemn feasts. So shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of men, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Hmm. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Ties in perfectly with Romans chapter 11. Replacement theology is a satanic lie. Always has been, always will be. If you're saved, if you're a Christian, don't you ever fall for replacement theology. If you have fallen for it, you need to repent. I would say you need to get down on your knees and you need to ask God for forgiveness for believing something so satanic as replacement theology. Um, if you have been teaching it, you really need to repent of it. All right. Um, if you're Jewish and you've watched this whole study, um, I pray for you that you have enough sense to realize the imminent danger that you are in as a Jew and that you would come to Jesus Christ as your Messiah and get saved. You can watch our salvation message. Uh, salvation works for anybody. Okay. All you have to do is come to God as a sinner. Drop the self-righteousness. You're not going to be justified by the law. You're not going to be justified by prayers and alms and all the proper keeping the Sabbath day and all the other stuff like that. It's not going to save you. All you got to do is just come and say, I'm a sinner. But you see, that's a lowering of pride. You know, uh, I've heard Jews call people like me, goyim, or pigs, or dogs, you know, you're Gentile. Mm -hmm. But you better get down here in the mud with us Gentiles and uh, come to God as a sinner. Lower the pride. Say, I refuse to do that. Okay. Then you miss the, the catching away of the body of Christ and you go into the time of Jacob's trouble. Then you're going to see the New Testament confirmed. But uh, it's going to be rough. It's going to be very rough for you. My suggestion is get saved right now. Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day. He fulfilled all the requirements for the Messiah. Again, I have a study on that. Okay, There's a lot of false teaching going around Judaism, modern day Judaism. Uh, there's a lot of very false teaching out there about Jesus Christ, uh, mocking Jesus Christ, tearing Jesus Christ down. And by the way, these replacement theology people, they claim that they're Christians and stuff like this. They hate Jesus Christ as bad, if not worse, than the Jews do. The Christ-rejecting Jews, I should say. Oh, yeah. Stephen Anderson, one of the ringleaders of this modern-day satanic cult of replacement theology, uh, he teaches that Jesus Christ burned in hell. Yeah, I mean, these, these guys, they're wicked. Completely wicked. But this passage right here, Ezekiel 36, is another one that you can use to debunk this whole, this whole lie of replacement theology. They're brought back in unbelief, and God restores them. Perfectly in line with Romans chapter 11. That's going to be it for this study. Um, this is one that I... And, and you know, there, there are plenty of other scriptures we could go to in these little replacement theology heretics. Oh, what about this and what about that? Honestly... From what I've seen, um, they're not too concerned with what the Bible actually says. They'll throw a bunch of scriptures at you, and when you say, well, let me actually show you what the Bible teaches on that subject. Can I show you? I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. My mind's made up. You're a heretic. You're, you're a crypto Jew. You're uh, um, blah, blah, blah. They, they say all this stuff like this. <laughs> okay, whatever. You know, they have a spirit of Satan. See, the Antichrist spirit they try to say that the Jews have an Antichrist spirit because they reject Jesus Christ. Well, that is the spirit of Antichrist, sure. But you see, the, the true spirit of Antichrist is he sets himself up in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. He causes the sacrifice and oblation to cease. The Antichrist is anti-Semitic. And yeah, he'll make a little peace treaty at first, 
but he's going to break that. He's going to break the covenant like that. And he's going to start to murder the Jews like any good Roman Catholic would do. You see, because that is the spirit of Roman Catholicism. The Antichrist spirit is anti-Semitic. They hate Jews. In fact, they hate a certain Jew that died on the cross. You see, the, the New Testament does say that the Jews caused Jesus Christ to be put to death, but uh, the Jews didn't crucify Jesus. The Romans did. And uh, by the way, Pilate, uh, what he did there was illegal. Him crucifying Jesus Christ on the cross was completely illegal. There weren't proper charges. But you see, he did it because he feared his little position. If you don't crucify, the, you know, the Jews are saying to him, if you don't cru crucify this Jesus, this Jesus Christ guy, if you don't crucify him, you're not a friend of Caesar. And Pilate's like, Oh man, what if this gets back to my superiors? Oh no, oh it's not good. I, this, this could look bad for me. I could lose my job. So what did he do? An illegal trial. He had no right to scourge Jesus. And then he crucifies him. Condemns and murders an innocent man. The Romans were the ones that killed Jesus. Hmm. But we'll close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for uh, saving uh, someone like myself. Uh, the Gentiles out there, Lord, uh, all of us, we're, we're very grateful that, that the Jews provided a way for us to be saved through, through your Son, Jesus Christ. And I thank you, Lord, for all those Jews that got saved back there in the first century and that... And that uh, lived very bold lives and, and witnessed for you and, and uh, gave us your word that we can be led into the truth. But Lord, I really do pray for the Jewish people out there today, those that have not received you yet as their Messiah. I really do pray for them, Lord, that they would wake up. Some of them would wake up. I know nationally they won't wake up. They're going to have to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. They're going to have to see your wrath poured out just as they did all throughout the Old Testament. But, uh, Lord, I do pray that there might be some Jews out there that would see this message and that would look up the Scriptures for themselves, Lord, that they wouldn't believe me, that they would cry out to you for truth, Lord. And I, I just pray for some of them that they would, that they would get saved and uh, not have to go through this horrible time that's coming. And, Lord, I pray that the body of Christ uh, right now would wake up to the very, very serious threat of replacement theology, this Catholic damnable heresy. I just really do pray, Lord, that, that uh, people would wake up and, and be strengthened and not fall for this satanic lie. And um, I just pray, Lord, that you would keep all of us in your word and uh, help us to witness, help us to be bold, Lord, as times get worse and worse, as the sodomy agenda gets stronger, the Catholic sodomy agenda, the Catholic replacement theology agenda, and on down through, Lord. I just pray that you would help your saints to stand against this onslaught of evil until you take us out of here. And I just pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, that is it for that video. Uh, we'll be coming out with another video soon on the uh, subject of New Testament prophecies uh, for the Jewish people. Um, the test of a prophet in your Bible is that their prophecies have to come to pass 100%. Uh, there are no 99% uh, successful prophets that are recognized by God. Uh, if they don't come to pass 100%, then they're not of the Lord. It's as simple as that. And I can assure you that the New Testament uh, is coming to pass 100%. And I say is, it's not has come to pass 100% because there's still some prophecies that are yet in the future. But everything up to this point is just right in line with what's going on. So we're going to be talking about that in another study. A uh, very interesting uh, thing coming up here. But um, I just, phew, boy, since I've been really attacking this replacement theology crowd and, and going after false prophets like Stephen Anderson, I'm seeing the hatred from these replacement theology people. 
I mean, literally calling for the death of people. I saw this one guy, uh, Morbius Stone, I think his, his YouTube name was. And he's, you know, these people, they'll comment on my videos and I can't reply to them. It's really weird, you know, and, and, uh, I've had a lot of weird things going on with these Anter snake people. Uh, they're definitely Google people. I mean, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that these people are NSA or Google or they're, they're within the government. Um, interesting that they'd be pushing replacement theology and defending Steven Anderson. Hmm. But, uh. You know, because some of these guys, I, I've, you know, reported them, and I went through the whole process of reporting the one guy. He, he was using my name, you know, and I tried to report him, and it was just like Google did nothing about it. You know, fraud. I mean, just total fraud and a criminal offense, and Google just went, oh, yeah, I don't know what happened to that, you know, that thing there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these guys, I block them from my channel, and they'll still come in and post comments. Now, you can't do that unless you're an administrator of, an, of the different website there, of, of YouTube. Interesting that these people would be supporting and radically, radically defending Steven Anderson, you know. But I'm seeing this hatred, this complete, just vile hatred for the Jewish people, you know. And yet they'll, compl they'll, they'll claim, oh, but we want to see them saved. We want to convert them. Yeah, just like the Catholics did. You know, if you've seen my study on the Ustashi, how they'd come in and they'd say to the Croatian people, the people in Yugoslavia and things, they'd say, they'd say, convert or we'll slaughter you. You know, and many times the people would convert and they'd kill them anyhow. But, you know, the point is, that's what Catholics do. So don't, don't fall for this thing of, oh, Stephen Anderson, he wants to see Jews saved. No, he wants to see Jews leave everything that they, that they believe in and be converted to, you know, weird Catholic fundamentalist Catholics like Andersnake. That's what's going on there. So I'm going to be coming out with more videos, um, a lot of different things, different subjects coming up. So please keep us in your prayers. Uh, things are certainly heating up uh, right now. Uh, it's, it's incredible. I mean, to see how bad things are getting very, very quickly, how bad things are getting. Um, so we really, really covet your prayers and uh, I guess that's going to be it so we will see you in the next video